Welcome back into the Original Gangsters Podcast. I am Scott Bernstein, along with my partner in crime, my uh, very, very valuable co-host, the doctor, uh, Jimmy Bucciolato. Hi, everyone. And uh, behind the glass, we got our uh, MVP producer, Benito Agosta. Thank you, Benny, for uh, being here and helping us out. Um, this is an episode that I am just chomping at the bit to jump into the deep end for. I uh, am have anticipated this interview more than maybe any that I've done in the last couple years. And for, for people that have been uh, just kind of finding us on YouTube, Original Gangsters Podcast, we have a really deep archive from when we were just audio for about two and a half, three years. We've gone to video now in the last six months. So if you're just finding us on YouTube, hit our channel and go in, you know, dig into the crates. And uh, we've we've done a lot on uh, hip hop, a lot on pop culture, a lot on black mafia family. And we're gonna throw it into a blender and uh, get this thing mixed up into some really, really nitty gritty uh, investigative nuance and insight into the murder of rap pioneer jam master j part of run dmc it's 20 years ago this week that jam master j was murdered in his studio in uh queens and the alleged perpetrators uh one man by the name of uh, ronnie washington tenard washington and carl little d jordan uh, are going on trial 20 years later in the coming months, uh, first degree murder charges uh, in the homicide of Jam Master J, AKA Jason Mizell. And today we have, we always go straight to the source. And uh, I am very, very, very happy to welcome aboard to the OG podcast, Frank Owen, who is the go-to source on the Jam Master J uh murder he has been reporting on it for 20 years all of his reporting has been groundbreaking his first piece in playboy magazine back in 2003 really gave the the context to you know what was surrounding this this at that point unsolved homicide and he just had another uh bombshell report that dropped on the anniversary uh, which was October uh, uh, 31st, 2022 is the 20 year anniversary. And he broke some big news related to Jam Master Jay's murder being tied to a botched Black Mafia family drug deal. And that the guy that Jam Master Jay was dealing with, who for the last 20 years we've only known as an alias, uh, as uncle, has now been identified by, by sources to Frank as Black Mafia family co-founder, uh, Terry Southwest T. Flannery. So Frank, thank you so much for coming on board. We are just so excited to have you. Great, thank you guys. So Frank, let's just, like I said, let's, uh, let's, let's jump into the deep end here. 20 years later, Jam Master J, uh, his murder carried out 20 years ago this week in Queens. You know, anybody that's a fan of hip hop knows that he was a part of the trio run DMC that brought rap and hip hop to the mainstream. They were at the forefront, you know, they were the pioneers pioneer in, in the in the ascent of hip hop and rap music. He was the DJ. He crafted the image, the all black Adidas um, inspired look. And mm -hmm. uh, just let's talk about when you first started reporting on this and maybe how you got to what you reported in 03, and then we can jump, you know, the 19 years later and how we're, where we're at now. Well, um, well, if, if it started with, actually I was on holiday in Vegas after I just finished my first book, um, Clubland, the fabulous rise and murderous fall of club culture. And this guy called um, uh, this guy called uh, Schoon, Curtis Schoon, had approached Playboy magazine, um, basically offering inside dope about the Jam Master J murder. Basically, Schoon had been identified as a suspect in the, the case 
by the NYPD over this drug deal that he and Jay did in 1995. The drug supplier ran off with the money and Schoon was mad at Jay, basically, he I think, I mean, according to my sources, he threatened to kill him, but, um, but it was Schoon's money that financed the deal, but um, uh, basically Jay eventually paid him back. Um, so Schoon approached Playboy, wanting to clear his name, offering inside dope about the Jam Master Jay story, they assigned some other guy to do the story. He got scared because of the people involved in, um, you know, in Jay's murder. They were looking around to um, find somebody else to do it. My name came up because I was, I mean, I was used to dealing with gangsters. I'd, I'd uncovered um, a mafia connected drug ring at the Limelight nightclub, which is this notorious nightclub in New York. Um, I mean, the guys who ran it were so upset by my reporting, they tried to kidnap me off the street and um, take me to Staten Island to cut off my thumb. An idea they got from watching this movie called The Pope of Greenwich Village. You remember that movie, The Pope of Greenwich Village? Yes, Bed Bug, Bed Bug Eddie. One you of the great bad guys. Charlie, they took my thumb. You remember yeah, that scene? Yeah, yeah. Right? Very really underrated. Right? These idiots, right? So I was used to dealing with these kind of mobsters. Um, so um, basically, Schoon introduced me to a... I mean, he, he was the one who... He was the first person to tell me that Jay was involved in drug dealing, right? Um, and that basically as a middleman, he would like travel the country and would set up, um, you know, um, buyers and uh, he, he would basically introduce, you know, people he knew to this guy called Uncle and, and they would set up like drug deals. That was basically, he was kind of like a middleman. He was also very hands-on, right? So he was the first person who told me that. Now that was kind of difficult to, to, uh, to I mean, to rationalize because, you know, like, if you remember Run DMC, they were always against gangsterism. They were very much, um, you know, at least, you know, in public anti-drugs. They did, you know, public service announcements rapid about staying in school and staying off drugs, you know, that sort of thing. So this, this, this and I, I knew Jay from my previous life as a music critic. And so it was a little shocking to find out that Jay was involved in, um, you know, in, in drug dealing. And, you know, a lot of people just didn't want to believe it because, you know, I mean, Jay was very beloved by people in, in Hollis, Queens. He was very well liked. They didn't want to kind of tarnish his image, you know, they, uh, and people, and a lot of people just didn't want to believe it, you know, that Jay was involved in drug dealing. So, you know, basically I started digging around um, I mean, the first thing I wanted to know was why the hell was he doing this, right? I mean, Run DMC was one of the biggest, you know, rap groups, was the biggest rap group of the 1980s. They sold millions of records, right? How come he was involved in doing drug deals? He didn't need the money. Well, it turns out he did need the money because what happened as so often happens, and not so much today because rappers are much more financially savvy, in those days, you know, it wasn't, I mean, he spent a lot of money during his heyday, during the, the Raising Hell heyday, spent a lot of money on his parents, on, on friends, on his sister, you know, on cousins, and forgot to pay his taxes. <laughs> well, and, and Frank, it should, you know, it should be noted that when Jay-Z gets paid, he's getting paid just as Jay-Z. When right. Eminem gets paid, he's getting paid as Eminem. When Run DMC got paid, they had to split that three ways. Three ways. Not to and, mention what you're, what you're giving to Russell Simmons and Def Jam. And the, and the other thing is that not many people know this, but Jay was never officially a member of the group. He was not contractually a member of Run DMC. Right. So now I talked to Russell about that, and Russell says it was split three ways that he got the same as Run and DMC. Now I heard that wasn't true at all. That in fact, Russell always preferred Ron because Ron was his brother. But regardless, 
um, he basically incurred this huge tax bill, right? Which, you know, over time ballooned to about half a million dollars, right? So, and, you know, and after, you know, raising hell, I mean, run, um, basically Russell Sue profile records, and, and that, uh, which was the, the, um, the record label Ron DMC was signed to just after raising hell. So that, he put their career on hold for two years, that whole lawsuit. And by, by the time they came out, NWA had released Straight out of Compton and Gangster Rap was all the rage. So Run DMC seemed kind of corny, they'd, they'd fallen out of fashion. And um, so the next album, I mean, it wasn't a bomb, but it didn't, it didn't do anywhere as, near as well as Raising Hell. So, you know, so it's kind of like an old story, you know, they, they made a lot of money very quickly and then they were no longer making money. And, and then the IRS came calling, you know? So he was basically, you know, he was basically, he was looking basically to make money quickly. Um, and that, that the IRS basically wouldn't take because don't forget the IRS had a lien on his earnings, you know? So basically everything he was making, most of that was going to the IRS. Um, so he did what everybody else did in Hollis or all the people he, he knew in Hollis did. If he wanted to make money in a hurry, he turned to dealing drugs. Now the first time he, um, the first drug deal he did, which was the drug deal that Schoon was involved in, was a disaster. He got he got robbed. He got robbed basically. He got robbed. So, but that didn't deter him. He kind of, you know, he the, um, he, he 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 continued to, you know, oh over time he became not a major player in the drug trade, but he was, you know, it was like a profitable side hustle. Until he met this guy called Uncle. Let me interject one second. I want to. I want to contextualize. So, it. I think it's kind of foreshadowing, and I want to get your opinion on this. Right. So I, I think it's kind of foreshadowing that the first drug deal that that or the first major drug deal that Jam Master Dre tries to uh, pull off. He's this was rough. 1995. Yes. This was 1995. Right. Uh, right. He's he's robbed at gunpoint. They don't care who he is. I mean, I don't right. even know if they knew who he was. No, but, he was actually somebody who was he supposedly a friend. <laughs> Some but, friend. but somebody the, knew. The, the bottom line was that the person that he was doing the deal with, they didn't care that he got robbed. They were like, "You still owe us the money for that deal." Yeah. Well, my point is the stakes were established early on. Whether he knew them from a distance, at that point he knew them, you know, from uh, you know at Front Street there, and so my point is he knew he knew the stakes, and you know fast forward to what happened in two thousand and two, and you have a situation where, and you point this out in your article uh, with with one of your sources, t ten kilos gets you killed. Right. I mean, right. Uh, th th this is no, uh, this isn't child's play. Right. Well, you've got to bear in mind the initial deal was just for a key. So he started off small. He wasn't doing, he wasn't doing major keys. He wasn't moving major keys until he met uncle. It was uncle. At that point, he then became a major player in the drug trade. You know, the, the initial deal he did was only for a key, right? So he wasn't like doing major, shifting major keys until he met Uncle. It was Uncle that enabled him to become, start making serious money as a drug dealer. And Uncle, you know, and Uncle, you, uh, Uncle basically, the, the relationship with Uncle was that you know, Uncle would, you know, wasn't just supplying him with like 10 keys, 20 keys, 30 keys at a time. Right? He also wanted to invest in um, in this movie. In a film. Jay was doing, yeah, called Forever Frank. Um, and, you know, that was very typical. Now, you know, I didn't know at the time it was Black Mafia family, but that was typical of the Black Mafia family. They were always looking for like legitimate projects to launch. Well, they, they definitely wanted to um, promote a uh, an image of hip hop entrepreneurs right. um, 
I, you know, from my reporting and research, I, I question, you know, how much of it was lip service, how much of it was um, creating a narrative to dispel the the notion of the federal government that they were these uh, burgeoning uh, drug kingpins. Uh, so, but I, I, that's, I guess, neither here nor there. In the movie, but, there are perfect ways to loan the drug money. Yes. So there's certain like things that are like nightclubs, independent record labels, you know, and, and an independent movie is a great way to loan the drug money. But and they were, inve they were investing in, uh, as the, you know, as the Black Mafia family, uh, right. the, just so, just so uh, you know, again, everybody knows, just let, letting everyone know the lay of the land here, uh, the Flannery brothers, uh, two uh, siblings from Southwest Detroit, took uh, a, a very small group of uh, childhood friends and lieutenants uh, in Metro Detroit in the uh, you know early 1990s, and by the new millennium, by 2000, they had uh, parlayed that and expanded to you know over a dozen states and major cities. They had become you know what I've coined the Walgreens of wholesale cocaine. They right. in, in almost in in miraculous fashion, they did it by diplomacy more so than uh, brute force. And the, 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 Flannery, the Flannery brothers are, are really the, the definition of the, you know, we're the OG podcast. They're the different, they're the definition of the new G uh, drug kingpins uh, of, uh, of the 20, 21st century. So uh, that's who the Flannery brothers were. We didn't know, we didn't know until literally the last 48 hours when uh, Frank dropped this, this bomb of a report on the anniversary that, um, the person that Jam Master J got hooked up with in 1996, who was feeding him an endless supply of, of cocaine that he was brokering to uh, people that he knew, uh, wasn't just any ordinary Black Mafia family lieutenant or underling. Uh, he was dealing directly with Terry Flannery, according to your sources. Yeah, well, that that was the thing. I mean, it, it, it actually that that's an updated story, an updated version of a story that that came out in, in last November, just to be accurate. Well, okay. I knew this that it was Terry Flannery, or at least I knew that the FBI believed it was Terry Flannery in uh, 2017. Was it? Uh, let me just check. I'll check. I'll check for you. Hang on a sec. Uh, and, and when you're when you're checking, let me just add for for our listeners and viewers uh, something that I haven't reported yet, but I think I'm going to roll out uh, this week, so you'll get it. You know, you you get the you get the insight first. Uh, I, I meant to report this a couple months ago, but for whatever reason, I didn't, and it makes sense with Frank's reporting uh, that both Terry and Demetrius Flannery have been served with subpoenas uh, to appear or to potentially appear uh, as witnesses at uh, the trial for Jam Master Jay's murder. No, yeah. get the fuck out of here. Yeah. How'd you know this? Uh, I have very good Black Mafia family sources. That's, that's something. Oh, man. Because, you know, I mean, I never said it in, in that, in, in the, in the story, in the story, that I believed it was Terry Flannery. What I said was that I got a phone call from um, from uh, this guy Cassidy, who was a, uh, an investigator who was working the case, and he asked me point blank, "Did I know if Uncle was Terry Flannery?" Right? And I'm like, "I didn't know. No, I don't. I didn't know that at this point. This was what 2016 or something like that." No, I said, "No, I have no idea who Uncle was." And he said, well, this source is telling us that that uncle is Terry Flannery. So anyway, I'm talking to one of my sources like about a year ago, and I mentioned this to him, right? And he says, yeah, that was me. And so he tells me this whole story about, he was the source that the, 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 the investigator was referring to, right? That he tells, I mean, it's such a great story. Um, he tells me this story about how he's, um, now you gotta understand, he's, he talked to uncle on the phone. He, he was lying basically Jay's right-hand man in the drug operation. 
And he was the guy who used to go to St. Louis to pick up 10, 20, 30 keys of coke from a black mafia family stash house. So he was well aware it was black mafia family, right? But he had no idea who uncle was. Now he talked to uncle at least a dozen times on the phone, but he never met him in person, right? So, so one, one night, and this was, when was this, 2016, right? He's listening, he, he's watching this documentary, BMF, the rise and fall of a hip hop drug empire. And I, be, I believe I am uh, one of the people that are that, that are featured in that documentary. Right. So he's watching this documentary, and and it features this wiretap of Terry Flannery that was recorded by the investigators, right? And so this guy falls off the couch. He goes, "I know that voice. I know that fucking voice. It's Uncle. It's freaking Uncle, right?" So the, he then tells the FBI that uncle is Terry Flannery, and that's how they found out about it, right? So, you know, I was very, I mean, I was very careful not to say, you know, um, conclusively that uncle was Terry Flannery, because I didn't know 100%, you know, I have this investigator telling me they think it's uncle. I have this source telling me, he heard uncle's voice on this documentary. Um, I also had a, a, a source close to Terry, Terry wouldn't speak to me, of course, saying that he'd been, he'd been visited in prison by investigators who wanted his cooperation on the Jam Master J case, right? Um, so that's to me is like 80%, it's not 100%. But if they've been frigging like subpoenaed, that's 100%. So I am so glad to hear that. So thank you for that information. Yeah, okay. so I, I, I know that, uh, you know, Demi for, for people that aren't aware, Demetrius is still locked up. He's in uh, a federal correctional facility in uh, outside of Portland, Oregon. And uh, He's got about six years left to do. Terry go has, go Terry's, I just want to, I just want the, the, the listeners and the viewers to know. Terry, AKA uncle, AKA Southwest, or a, possibly uncle, alleged by some people to be uncle. Um, Southwest T. Flannery was released uh, two years ago during the COVID um, pandemic yeah. and his finishing out his uh, sentence on home confinement He's working a, a, a regular nine to five job. I've been up to that job to have have lunch with him and have some conversations with him. Um, he is royalty. And uh, I've reported this, that uh, when he came home, there was a, a, a line uh, around the block uh, with people from all walks of life uh, waiting to come into his mother's house, Lucille's house, uh, where, he, where he's living and pay their respects and kiss his ring and take a, a selfie with him. You know, uh, fathers bringing their sons. <laughs> uh, there, there were people called, you know, hip hop lumer, uh, luminaries from around the country were flying in uh, to meet and, or not to meet, to, to welcome him home. LL uh, Cool J, Fabulous, Nelly, Puffy, 50 Cent, they all came in town. Um, I heard there were some clandestine meetings possibly with uh uh other power players from from his past and uh he is just you know he's back and he's he's got an instagram up uh puffy gave him a um or or i don't know it was puffy or 50 gave him a, a bentley as a welcome home present so he he's not keeping a, my point is he's not keeping a low profile you know all the stories they tell me they tell me about Run DMC or, or that Jam Master J, you know, there's always a mixture of fact and fiction, right? So, I mean, the classic example is that interview I did with Tenard, with Ronald Washington in the uh, original Playboy story, which, it was, I mean, it was extraordinary to me that he would even talk to me, but he was the one who told me about that trip to Washington, that he and Jay went to Washington, met uncle, uh, uncle gave the 10 keys of coke, they took it to Baltimore, and Yakim, who was a, a friend of Jay's, ran off with the coke, right? Now, all of that turned out to be 100% true, right? 
what wasn't true was the stuff he told me about what happened after. So he's telling me this true story in order to try and get me to believe this other lie. And the lie was he basically ratted out his, his, his co-conspirator, Little D, Carl Jordan, and Carl Jordan's father, Big D, and basically said that uh, on the night of the murder, he was coming back to the studio after buying bullets for Jay's gun and saw Carl Jordan, he heard gunshots and saw Carl Jordan and Big D running from the studio. Now, he it's true that Carl Jordan shot like um, sh shot Jay, shot Jason Mazzell, right? But Big D wasn't on the scene of the crime. So he's basically written out Big D and Little D in order to deflect blame from, from his own role in the murder. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. he's, he's spinning a tale that's half true in order to try and get me to believe the, the second bit, which is he had nothing to do with the murder, right? And then he also tried to implicate uncle. Now I'll say this up front now. I don't think the feds believed Terry had anything to do with Jam Master Jay's murder. Yeah, I, I want to make that clear as well. But, My reporting has been very uh, emphatic in that, and, and I've reported on top of Frank's reporting over the last year, a couple of years. Uh, but, in, re in regards to this, that, that my sources, that there is nobody in, in law enforcement, federal or local, uh, accusing Terry or Demetrius or anyone in Black Mafia family for being complicit or involved in the conspiracy to murder uh, Jay. Just the fact that a drug deal that was Black Mafia family, uh, created by Black, Black Mafia family and consummated via Black Mafia family connections that deal that fell apart on the end of the buyers uh, ended up causing another situation that ended up with, with Jay being murdered. It had nothing to do with the right. fact that who was well, funding what, the drug deal. What Tenard was trying to do, and he was, I mean, definitely, I mean, I had basically identified him in the Playboy piece 18 years before he was arrested. He was definitely in the studio. He was one of the gunmen. But what he was trying to do was imply that somehow, because Jay lost the coke, he owed $180,000. We're talking about 10 keys of coke here. He owed $180,000 to Terry Flannery, and he didn't have the money, and that Terry was going to send somebody to kill him. That's what he was trying to imply. Right, which, go, which Frank, which goes against the M.O. of Black Mafia family. Yeah, I mean, why would why would fuck? They don't. Well, they, they don't kill. They don't kill people. That's not <laughs> Black Mafia family's M.O. If that was the case, then their 2005 bus would have would have included 15 years worth of homicide. But it didn't. I mean, I mean, I mean the thing about the Flannery brothers was they were smart. Why would Terry Flannery? kill a well-known hip-hop artist over $180,000 when they were making millions every day. They were making so much money, they didn't know what to do with it. Right. There's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a piece, an interesting part in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the latest story where the guy who was my source, who was working with Jay, he said that they would give a discount if you came with the hundreds rather than tens and twenties, because they couldn't move the fucking money. You know, it was like they were just having trouble moving the money. So if you came with, say, if, because it was all done on uh, on consignment, you know, it was like, you know, there was no money up front. You know, they give you a month, you came back with the money. If you came back with it all in the hundreds, you got up, they took $2,000 a key off, you know. So that tells you that they were having trouble it wasn't the drugs they were having trouble moving. It was the amount of money. Yeah. Wait, right. Frank, can I just back up for a second? I want to oh. set the scene, and then I'm going to throw it back to you. Just oh. to, again, put some context here. And then I want to go to the actual murder, and then the investigation, and then where we stand today, I think right. two months away from a jury selection starting in the trial. So uh, Jam Master J is fully involved in the drug game. Uh, in the mid nineties until his death in 2022, he hooks up with uh, a black mafia family. 
and is brokering drug deals uh, as he is also performing with Run DMC and trying to run uh, uh, music labels and sign acts. Wow. He uh, gets involved in the summer of 2002 uh, with a drug deal in Washington, D.C. that's wow. set up by, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, it, was, uh, it was uh, oh, uh, end of August 2000, um, 2002, yeah. And uh, meanwhile, uh, a, a, a acquaintance or a friend of his uh, comes home from prison, and that's uh, Ronnie Tenard Washington. Right. And just so people understand who this kind of the character that this guy is uh people have compared him and frank compares him in some of his articles to a uh, weebay from from the uh, the wire uh he was just a, a shooter a stick-up kid an enforcer right. um and jay welcomes him home uh takes him out buys him clothes buys him a car tries to st give him some work he also is acquainted with, at that time, an 18-year-old, uh, Carl Jordan, who went right. by the nickname Little well, D, who's an aspiring rapper, whose well, dad, Big D, was Run DMC's road manager, manager, tour yeah. manager. Well, well, uh, well, well Tino was so close to Jay that Jay allowed him to stay at the family home, and Tenard began dating Jay's sister, Benita. So okay. Jay's killer was dating his sister. That shows you how close they were. Yes. Right. And I mean, back before he went to prison, when they grew up together, they were kids together. Right. Jay's mom, Connie, she used to cook dinner for both of them. And that's the really sad thing about this whole story is that, like, you know, it was like everybody, you know, the people involved in killing him were all like related to him in one way or another. Right, like, you know, Little D was his, um, you know, that's uh, Carl Jordan, that was his godson, for Christ's sake, right? You know, uh, Tenard, you know, was, was he one of his best friends when he was, when he was growing up in Hollis. Um, so, I mean, that tells you, I mean, that's really the kind of ultimate betrayal here, you know? We're talking about people, not only people he grew up with, but, 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 but not only people he grew up with, but people he went out of his way to help with money, with jobs, with places to stay. These are the people who murdered him, you know. And I mean, that's really, that's what really sticks in my craw about this story. Because those motherfuckers in the studio, every last one of them knew straight away who killed Jay, right? They all fucking knew, every one of them. Randy Allen, who was in the studio, Jay's manager, uh, Lydia, who was Randy's sister, all of them knew. And except for Lydia, Lydia was the only one who had any balls, ironically. Um, well, they, they basically told a whole bunch of bullshit to the, to, the, to the detectives and to the investigators. And that's why it took like 18 years. Now, I understand they were scared of Tinard. Ronald Washington is a scary person, but this was their best freaking friend, right? They didn't have the courage to tell the truth. You know, I mean, it's outrageous this thing took 18 years to solve when they knew damn well you know, right from the moment Jay was killed, who did this? This was not a freaking secret, you know? I knew this, right? And I'm like just some limey white boy, you know, who knows how to report a story. I, I mean, within like a week or two weeks of starting all this story, I knew who killed Jay. Those motherfuckers in the studio, except for Lydia, who did actually testify before a grand jury, they should be ashamed of themselves. But isn't this part of like the no snitch? Like, um, you know, that's a thing in Detroit, other urban neighborhoods. I mean, it's similar to you think of like Omerta with Italian organized crime, but yeah, there's but it's that, not the same you know. at all. You're not snitching on somebody, like you're snitching on somebody who murdered your best friend in cold blood. No, yeah, I mean, I, I believe me, I'm not, def <laughs> I'm not defending that, uh, you know, having that, that code, but um, wouldn't it be, I'm just, it, rather than well maybe part of it is that they were fearful but um 
I don't know. Isn't that sort well, of like you, you never trust law law enforcement? Was it loyalty or was it fear? Were they, they being loyal to Tenard or did they fear that they Tenard was going to kill them? Tenard. They have not loyalty to Tenard. Any loyalty, their loyalty should have been to Jay because Jay was their meal ticket. Jay was the one who was paying all the bills. Jay was the one who was employing them. Jay was the one who was putting 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 food on their table. They had no loyalty to Now they were scared of Tenard. I understand that. Um, but you know what? Show a bit of freaking courage. I mean, Lydia, who's the only woman who was there that night, she had the courage to come forward and testify before a grand jury. It was Tenard, and she did that a year after the murder. Those other motherfuckers, like Randy Allen, the, the manager, they told them a whole all this stuff about Schoon murder Jay, and it was uh, it was a beef of it, what was it with Murder Inc. and all those stupid theories about who murdered Jay. That all came from those people in the studio who lied. Disinformation, uh, disinformation. Yeah, they lied and lied and lied. And that's why it took so long. And you know what else is really interesting? If you read the court documents, and this is the thing I don't know and I'm trying to find out. In the latest court document, the, the, the government, I mean, the government, I'm not giving many details about this case, but they refer to two co-conspirators. That's unindicted co-conspirators. That's not Randy. Oh, the, sorry, that's not um, Ronald Washington. That's not Carl Jordan. It's two other people, right? So there was two other people involved in this conspiracy in, in addition to, to Washington and Jordan, right? So who are those two people, right? It's somebody close to Jay because they were all close to Jay. So it was it was it wasn't just Randy. It wasn't just uh, Ronald, Washington, and uh, and Jordan. Now who else could it be, right? I have a very hard time believing that um, Carl Jordan, who was eighteen at the time, did not tell his father what he was going to do. That seems very, very unlikely to me. Now, the other possible co-conspirator, and I don't know this for sure, uh, but a lot of people believe this, including Tanar's lawyer, Ronald Washington, is Randy Allen, right? Because I've, I've proven that Randy stole money from, from Jay, had been stealing money from him for years. I had like, the bookkeeper, the record company bookkeeper on the record saying that Randy stole money from Jay. I had Hurricane uh, and uh, another of Jay's friends. Hurricane is the Beastie Boys DJ. Her, and uh, Eric, Adam, uh, Eric, Eric Shake James, another close friend, saying that Jay told them both that he knew Randy was stealing from him. So it's confirmed that Randy was stealing money from Jay and had been doing it for years and years and years. I also have three sources, two on the record, one off the record, saying that, that Randy, that's his manager, his long-term manager, who, who he grew up with, right, stole Jay's chain and emptied Jay's wallet from, from his dead body before the police arrived which, if true, is so freaking outrageous, it's unbelievable, that your best friend just gets murdered in front of you, and the first thing you think of is, oh, yeah, I'm going to steal his chain and empty his wallet. Now, I'm not saying that is 100% true. What I am saying is that three of Jay's friends say that's true. Now, I don't know. I don't know that to be 100%, but that's what they're saying. But I do know for sure that Randy was stealing from Jay and had been stealing from him for a long time. So again, we see this pattern of friends betraying him, you know, of, of the people he helped, the people he employed, the people he, you know, you know took from. The, I mean, those people would have been like penniless on the street if it wasn't for Jay. Those are the ones who ultimately betrayed him. Let me, hey, let me ask you let me ask what? you guys something i i know you're we're both crime reporters and not social psychologists or, or sociologists but i i nevertheless can't help but ask i mean again we're talking about one of the most famous hip-hop groups of all time a guy yeah. who's very popular well known why is he hanging around with people like this i mean that's the question <laughs> you, you know what it is you know what it is it's this loyalty to the streets is what got him killed Right. Look, I mean, why did he never leave Hollis? Roman DMC did, right? They left Hollis. 
Jay always stayed behind because he had this loyalty to the neighborhood, to his friends. I mean, don't forget that all these people were part of this teenage burglary crew. Ronald Washington, Randy Allen, um, uh, well, little D was too old, but uh, was too young. But, you know, they created this bond, this kind of criminal bond when they were 17 and 18. And he always stood be behind them. Oh, but, uh, even though, you know, they went to jail, he went on to become a superstar. But as soon as they got out of prison, I mean, Randy went to prison, comes out, Jay makes him his manager. Tinar goes to prison, he comes out, Jay puts him up at the family home, gives him walking around money, um, employs him as an enforcer. So he never, it, he, it was almost like a, a point of honour with him to to stand by his childhood friends to never to always look after them and that's what got him killed in the end frank frank i, I want to um tell fill in the gap between the august drug deal or the the brokering of the of the deal in august in washington dc and the the, the two months till uh Jason Mizell is murdered. What turns? I mean, what turns Tenard Washington from friend to foe? He gets cut out of the drug deal, right? right. Well, what basically happens is this guy. Um, uh, so basically, what they were trying to do was you, Kim, who was also a member of this teenage burglary crew with Ronald Washington and Randy Allen, <laughs> Jason, right? Um, he'd, he'd moved to Baltimore, become a big time drug dealer in Baltimore. And he told Jay, you know, about the scene in Baltimore and that he can make some money here. So the whole purpose of the trip to Washington, D.C. was basically to hook up Uncle and, and, uh, and Yakim, right? Now, when somehow Ronald Washington persuaded Jay to let him come along and, and to be part of the deal, now, the problem was you came strongly objected to this, to this because Ronald Washington had burglarized your Kim's uh, apartment and stolen like a gun and bulletproof breast and some jewelry. So he's like, no fucking way. I'm not doing this deal with this motherfucker. You've got to cut him out. So Jay cut him out. Right. So Ronald Washington is pissed off about this. So then he then recruits little D who he'd been hanging out with and then become friends in this plot to murder Jay. So it was basically because he was cut out of the deal that, that Ronald Washington plotted to murder Jay. Very Shakespearean. And, and, and why, not, just, why not just since he is the golden goose, I mean, why not? Obviously, we're trying to I'm trying to project logic onto sociopathic people. But why like why not just try to get back in with them, like try, try to like smooth that out I, in a, 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 you know what I mean? A less extreme way than, oh, well, let's just kill him because he no longer includes us I have, in the. I have long and I don't know this to be a fact and this is like a theory, but I've long thought that they may not have intended to, to kill him that it was essentially a robbery that went wrong because they knew Jay always stole, carry thousands of dollars of, in his pocket. He had this $50,000 gold chain. It, it's possible it might have been a robbery, but from the government's point of view, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Because if you murder somebody in, 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 in if you kill somebody in the process of robbing them, that's murder, yeah. right? So from the called, government- it's called, fel it's called felony murder. Yeah, well, that's what he's charged with. He's charged with felony murder. That's why it's a federal case. It's not like he's not been charged in, uh, in, in New York State for murder. He's been charged felony murder uh, under a federal, uh, uh, you know, by the feds. So it's it's possible that they didn't actually mean to kill the guy uh, because you know never underestimate the stupidity of criminals right like Tenard was like like for one thing Tenard was drunk all the time he he drank a bottle of Hennessy a day he was constantly high you know so he, this guy is not fucking like like Einstein right he's not some criminal mastermind he's like a he's like you know he's a low level enforcer right so there's that and, and don't forget Tenard had um Tenard had already killed somebody. Um, I mean, this has been a rumor 
someone is there's someone that's, a, that's pretty famous or linked to a pretty famous person tell tell them yeah well, well let, let me get the name here it was uh, it was a uh, randy stretch walker it was two packs best friends right and he didn't even mean he shows what a more on this guy he is right um he didn't even mean to kill him right what it was was he was after randy's uh, uh, stretch stretch's brother right so he's like, there's this car chase through Hollis Queens. He has an automatic rifle. This is Ronald Washington. He leans out the window, fires this automatic rifle, um, and, and the car flips over. He thinks he's killed um, Stretch's brother, but in fact, he'd killed Stretch, Tupac's best friend. You know, Stretch was a rapper, right? So with the, we're not talking like, you know, a criminal mastermind here, right? So, you know, the fact that, you know, he killed the wrong person says to me that it's quite possible they didn't mean to kill Jay, but, you know, the gun went off or whatever, or for whatever reason, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because but, it, it's a federal felony murder case. So, you know. Frank, yeah. we were talking about MOs before. Or I was talking about MOs and, you know, what the modus operandi of Black Mafia family, but, and I know this is, circumstantial but little d carl jordan uh who's gonna go on trial uh, accused as a trigger man he w was an aspiring rapper and yeah. he would uh really one of his one. one of his trademarks uh in his rap persona was uh i, I only do headshots i yeah. don't i don't uh shoot at the body right. and, and jay um, was shot in the head yeah and J Master J was shot in the head. So well, that shows you what a freaking little moron the guy is, right? You shoot one of the, you know one of the most famous DJs in hip hop in the head, and then you have a fucking rap song where you're rapping about, oh, I don't shoot people in the body, I only shoot them in the head. I mean, what yeah. a moron, right? And uh, I mean, the, the government are going to use that if he, if this goes to trial. The other thing is, is this little shit like every year on the anniversary of Jay's passing, right? He was posting crap on his Instagram page about how he misses Jay, rest in peace, Jay. I mean, the fucking balls on this guy, you know what I mean? Um, to do that. And then to do a frigging rap video in front of a mural commemorating Jay, you know? But let me say this, right? While we're on little D, this might not go to trial, because if you look at the original indictment, it's pretty obvious to me what the government's trying to do is they're trying to get Little D to rat on on Tenard. That's what they're trying to do. I have a source who talks to the FBI all the time, and they're predicting this is not going to go to try. Because if you look at the original indictment, most of the most of the most of the most of the indictment has nothing to do with Jam Master J's murder. Most of the indictment is taken up with drug deals that little D pulled off that happened long after Jay's death, right? So, you know, so they've got him basically on video doing all these drug deals. I think it's about half a dozen different drug deals, right? You know, so they were obviously trying to basically, they're basically trying to say to him, look, we got you banged to rights on this, on this, um, on all these drug deals. You're going to do 20 years of this. If you don't want to spend the rest of your life in prison, then you better like cut a deal with us so, and testify against Ron, Ronald Washington. Now, so far, that hasn't worked. I thought by now, because the, 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 the only way out of this for, for little D is to testify against Ronald Washington, right? That's the only way. But so far, They've 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 hung tight. They happened. I mean, I've talked to the lawyers, and they're like, "Nope, we've got a trial on this. We've got a trial on this." But they have a ton of witnesses, you know, because it's not just like big Ronald Washington is bragging about the murder in prison. You've got this little idiot little D bragging about the murder as well, like threatening people, saying, "I'll kill you, like I killed Jam Master J." I mean, come on. I mean, Jesus Christ, what a stupid thing to do. So they've got basically the government has like two witnesses, one saying that Ronald Washington bragged about the murder. Uh, in fact, they have more than one witness. They have two witnesses because they have his girlfriend as well, because he bragged about the murder to his girlfriend, Danielle McDonald. And, and they've also got um, somebody who Little D threatened to kill. Um, and, and he's going to say that Little D bragged about killing 
Jam Master J. So, you know, as I said, we're not talking geniuses here, you know, they, they, you know, they, they, I mean, I mean, he was well known. I mean, like um, Jay's nephew, Bo Skaggs, little D shot him in the leg. And the reason, and this was like only a couple of months after the murder, the reason for this was that Bo, little D was mad because Bo put out a rap basically saying that little D shot, shot Jason, shot Jam Master Jay. So again, this was not, this is not a big freaking secret. It never was a big secret. The only mystery of this case, really, is why it took so bloody long to indict these two, you know? I mean, this we've known this for a long time. It's in the Playboy article. That was in 2003, yeah. you know? There's two big questions that remain unanswered here, which I'm determined to find out. So who were the two co-conspirators, right? Who were the other two people who were involved in plotting to murder Jay? And the other, the other question that's always puzzled me is, where did that 10 keys of coke go, right? <laughs> because I don't think that Yakim actually did run off with the coke. Now, Yakim might have had the coke. Jay might have taken it back to, 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 um, to Hollis to sell. But, you know, it's, it, it, you find out who, where this coke went, and I think you'll find out a lot more about the story. But the big thing is the two co-conspirators. Who was it? Who were the two people in addition to Ronald Washington and Carl Jordan who conspired to murder Jay? I had bet dollars to donuts that they're close friends of his because everybody involved in this were close friends of his. Yeah, I'll bet dollars to donuts that uh, there are two names that uh, we've talked about on this in this interview in the last uh, uh, 60, 70 minutes. Absolutely. absolutely. You, can, you, can, you can do the math yourself. Uh, that's my that's my uh, my personal belief. Well, thank you, Frank, so much. Uh, you know, Jimmy and I just kind of uh, sat back and, and let uh, Frank ride the horse here. We didn't want to um, interject uh, too much because Frank's such a great storyteller, and and like I said, he's the guy that uh, has been breaking all this news for 20 years. Now we're almost at the end of the line, but there's still some more uh, revelations to be had. Frank's on the scene. Frank's going to get it done, and hopefully he'll come back and, and share it with us. Um, Frank, is, it, is there anywhere people should know to be able to get a hold of you or, or consume your content? Uh, yeah, frankowen.substack.com. So check that out. Um, please like, subscribe, share. Uh, spread the word. OG Podcast is on YouTube now. Uh, we are full multimedia. We're going to be giving you uh, more content uh it's going to be coming at you now uh you know audio video hopefully we'll start doing some some live broadcast we'll do some remotes we're coming be, to your house right <laughs> we're going to be expanding and and playing around with the format but we'll see we'll we'll keep giving you that great true crime content you want every week we'll do uh, uh bar mitzvahs and birthday parties <laughs> yeah you know, we'll show up for christenings <laughs> Uh, so we'll see you next week uh, for Benny behind the glass for Jimmy uh, Frank our guest Scott Bernstein OG podcast out. Oh.